We did it. Three for three on guests in the new year. If you haven't been following along, um, we're now up to three episodes a week. So we hit the subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes. Let's get boomers out of the fitness industry. Today's guest, the one and only, the golden era hero, and is still in better shape than like 99% of bodybuilders today. Milo Sarchev, number one in your playbooks, number one in your hearts. The Serb that wouldn't stop. Absolutely love Serbians. If you're a Serbian and you're listening to this, let's be friends. I grew up and I felt bad. And we talk about this in the show that my last name didn't end in IC because all of my friends, all of them named Igor, which was like a hundred of them, all of their last names had a cool itch at the end, IC, and I wanted to be Shallowich or Shallowick. Um, and I wasn't because I was just a white kid from Canada. So uh, getting to dive in to Milosh's Pass, which as a bodybuilder is insane. If you don't follow Milosh on Instagram, it's absolutely wild the pictures he posts if you're into golden era bodybuilding, Ronnie Coleman uh, era, Kevin Lebrone. I mean, he competed against and beat the best of the best. And then you also look at his life now. Like he's ringside, Dana White, UFC, Las Vegas. Uh, such an interesting dude, such a nice dude. More stories than the bible and uh, i've been privy to some obviously on on the show but also in private if you ever get the chance or see milos and you're out and he's telling stories just pull up a chair uh, and if you're listening to this podcast pull up a chair and have a listen some just some great insight great wisdom if you want to talk like just a great story perseverance like imagine doing what he did in the time that he did it like he's yeah, one of a kind. Always a great time getting to sit down and chat with Milos. Definitely going to be making the trip out to Vegas this year to hang out and train with him. Uh, I'm still sore from a set that I did that lasted. Well, in my brain, the set is still going on. Uh, but training with Milos a few years back in Australia. Great time. So, guys, uh, check out the episode. Check out Milos on Instagram. If uh, you guys are interested, Prescript Level 1 Coaching Certification is live up for sale. This is going to start Monday, January 29th, taught by yours truly, James McIntosh, James Thayer, and Killian Hamilton. 16 weeks, applied biomechanics, functional anatomy. Please, for the love of God, if you prescribe exercise to someone for a living, know the source code, know your anatomy, know your biomechanics. Um, Course is up for sale live right now at www.prescript.com. Comes free with the Prescript Level 1 manual. Level 1 manual textbook I wrote on applied biomechanics, functional anatomy, and, you know, again, the key being applied. How is it that we actually apply this in real life when we train people, whether it's, you know, one-to-one -one in person on the gym floor or whether it's online, having an understanding of this stuff, having an understanding of load management will you know, you get better results, you solve more problems, you solve more expensive problems, you make more money. That's just the way it is. If you want longevity in this career, stop dumbing it down. You have to smarten up. That's what we're all about. All that being said, paying the bills here. Huge shout out Milo Sarchev for uh, you know, offering up some of his time and sharing his insight and wisdom. Uh, guys, if you enjoyed the episode, share it. Let's get boomers out of the fitness industry forever. Um, Lundy, hit it. You're tuned in to RX Radio. You're Serbian by, by blood, right? Yes, yes. I, I was born yeah. in Serbia. You know, what it, part? Uh, it's actually so that's Yugoslavia. And right. uh, uh, a part of Yugoslavia was Serbia. And the northern part of Serbia is province Vojvodina. And I was born in, uh, in the capital, Novi Sad. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, that's so Serbia has a very interesting intersection with my life. I grew up in southwestern Ontario and all of my friends last name ended in IC. So I was curious. I like I moved from the East Coast and where it was all like for Newfies, Newfoundlanders. And I was I was like almost felt out of place. I was like, can we be like Shallowick? Can I be Shallowich? Can we just change it to Shallowich, please? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. You see, my last name doesn't finish with the IC, which is surprising. But yeah, I'm uh, you know, from a large family, the Shachos. My, my, imagine my grandfather was seventeenth of the kids. You know, so so he he has like sixteen siblings. Yeah, <laughs> well, Serbians just have a different resolve. Like I don't, many people don't know the history of behind Serbia, but it's a country that's been at war since thirteen eighty nine. Oh yeah. If, if I got my math, I, dude, I'm telling you, like I'm. Yeah. 
I'm in with the sir. I sit in the Slav squad, full Adidas tracksuit, smoking cigarettes. Like, you know, that was my childhood was all Serbs. Hey, no, so it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, uh, we grew up. There's the Serbian center in my like little sub community of Windsor, Ontario is like the biggest event center in the neighborhood. So like when people get married, they're like, it's like not even a question where you get married, Serb center, even non-Serbians. So no it's way. like, yeah, Serbians have like a very, and I actually went to Belgrade for the first time since I've seen you last, I've been to Belgrade and, and my, um, my friend Milos took me around, obviously Milos, cause there's only eight names in Serbia. My, my two Igors were busy. So Milos <laughs> took me around yeah, Milos Zaric. So there's the IC Milos Zaric, a friend of mine in Belgrade took me around and like took me up the Adder River and the waterfront. It's wild, man. It's, it's so, it's such a, it's such well, a neat place. I wish you texted me when you were there. I mean, uh, I have some good friends over there. I lived in Belgrade from uh, 2013 to 16, uh, you know, because uh, uh, we started talking a little bit earlier before you clicked. Uh, I was in uh, um, Serbia until 1987, came in California uh, in October to compete in uh, Miss Universe to represent my country. But then I stayed, of course, and I stayed here until 2011 and then moved back. Uh, I was first in Finland, then went to the Dominican Republic, then went to Spain and finally ended up in uh, Serbia. And then I realized, you know, as much as I love Serbia, right, the, the life there uh, is something I left long ago and I just couldn't accommodate, you know. So once you experience this kind of freedom and opportunities, you want to come back. Yeah. yeah, but it's tough though. Like I, I, I still see the stain of Serbia on you in the way that you like conduct business, you conduct relationships. Like if people, if people don't have a Serbian friend, you need one token Serbian friend just to keep your head on straight because Serbians are like the most straight down the center of the plate. Like you could just, you could, cause it's the Serbian mother, like the Serbian mom. And like, you know, if George called, we were like, okay, but if Igor's mom called, like, that was the bat signal. Like, Igor would be anywhere in town, and if Igor's mom called you, like, yo, Igor, your mom just called me. Zoom! Gone. And it's like, nothing keeps some, like, nothing keeps a culture in line like a Serb. Yeah, uh, that's funny. That's funny. I love it. You know, uh, as you probably know, the, the, from little interactions that we have, and uh, probably from some uh, podcasts and stuff like that, uh, I'm born with no filter, you know, I, I, and, uh, and no secrets. You know, this is, uh, you know, my thing. It's, uh, you know, što ne umu, to ne grumu. I don't know if you, you had this. Whatever is in your mind, that's what you say it, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's the best way. Some people get offended. Look, when, when you mean the best for everybody, right, but uh, sometimes there is a place for criticism, and you say that criticism and they don't take it the right way, then all of a sudden, ah, you're, you're so harsh. You're, what do you mean? You know, for me, for example, in Serbia, I would always give me the, the uh, bad truth, the truth than the good lie, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, a lot of people here you can't handle it, you know? I feel like bodybuilding was a sport made for Serbian culture. It's nothing but subjective criticism yeah. and hard work. It's like, okay, what culture is better suited for those two virtues of a sport? Uh, unfortunately, I'm the only Serbian that uh, is at this level, right? Uh, which kind of bothers me because we are such a sports nation. Uh, I mean, but, you, you know, okay, let, let's touch that subject. I don't know how you, uh, with your upbringing, uh, uh, what they say about weightlifting and bodybuilding and, you know, you know building your body and, and uh, making muscles. My father was a neuropsychiatrist. He didn't approve a uh, man looking in the mirror for any other way, uh, reason but shaving, you know. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be narcissistic, right? You don't supposed to look in the mirror. And then you don't supposed to like really take care of your body so much. But, uh, you know, for me, uh, when I start training and then I realize he doesn't want me to, uh, I was pretending I was playing basketball, right? But I was going and, and lifting weights. And then I had to hide my muscle, <laughs> you know, you know this <laughs> and eventually, eventually, I mean, he figured me out, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Your father was also a detective. That must have really yeah, taken yeah. a lot of work. <laughs> the basketball is, uh, you know, 
kind of strangely responding to your body. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The only although I mean a good a good lie though, because Serbians, when it comes to sports, basketball is probably one of the the sports where they're best represented worldwide. Yes, I mean uh, just look at now Nikola Jokic, uh, two times MVP. Serbians were multiple world champions and uh, two times Olympic gold medalist in uh, yeah. in uh, basketball. I mean, yeah. gee. And then, I mean, the, the look no further than, like, the, in my opinion, the greatest athlete all, of all time is Serbia, Novak Djokovic. Thank you. I mean, it's uh, my absolute hero. And, uh, you know, they're still for some reason. Okay, now he's starting to be recognized and possibly, just like you said, not just best tennis player, but the best athlete of all time. I mean, the dominance and persistence, and he is still running. I mean, he's still going for number 25 and 26 and hopefully 30. Oh, right. yeah, he's, I mean, he's won eight Wimbledon straight. And I, I think, but most people don't respect the physicality of tennis and like how short your the career span can be in a sport that's, you know, there's no off season. The, you, you, gotta, you, you eat what you kill. And to be on, no athlete has been on top of their game for 20 years. Like, and no one has still, continue, after a 20-year career, is still is still in the ring taking punches like him. So, yeah, uh, the Serbian athletic prowess is strong. Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, he's pride and joy of all, us, all of us. Uh, super good person, super intelligent, and uh, super inspiring. I mean, uh, we, we have uh, uh, Carlos Alcaraz uh, now coming after him. Uh, but as you know, he, at U.S. Open, he managed to beat him. He was surprised at the Wimbledon. I mean, after complete dominance in Wimbledon, maybe he, I can't even say that, you know, who am I to say it, that he didn't consider that Carlos not being accommodated to the grass would be such a threat, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, he hardly play on the grass. And, uh, you know, he bettered him that day. But uh, I think Djokovic is going to continue dominance with the, Australian Open. That's where we met in Melbourne, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what? We were there uh, like January, February, just it about. It would have been around that time. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah it's so, funny. So, yeah. Well, so I mean. I don't know. This is how we met at, uh, at Melbourne, Melbourne. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's definitely a small world. And it's funny that you, 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 know, you kind of mentioned like the, we talked about the Serbian attributes culturally. And the idea of not having a filter and like kind of saying what you mean and meaning what you say. We kind of talk about Djokovic. Djokovic is probably most famously in the news in the last couple of years for his stance on COVID. He was like a political prisoner in Australia because he was he was just that right. It's it's it's. I don't think there's a country that lives. And I don't want to make this a pro Serbia podcast, although I definitely will. But there's not a country that is so true to their stereotypes because he, being like a pro athlete with obviously a lot to lose during covid was like yeah i'm not doing the jab yeah and they're and like we well, can't now now let's let's appreciate this uh, uh step further you, you uh, bless you. you you know you know how easy it would be for him to get the fake certificate of vaccination i mean you know we're talking about millions of dollars uh he won how many uh australian open 11 i think yeah no maybe yeah I mean, complete dominance over there at, at that uh, uh, hard court. Uh, he could have go there, make millions, uh, get another Grand Slam just by faking it. I mean, uh, you know, how many other people won't do that? Okay, just uh, let's uh, go around it. He could have a golden certificate with a, you know, golden vaccine, supposedly. You know what I mean? But no, he's a character and didn't want to do it and stand. Yeah to his guns and then he missed US Open as well. I mean, imagine, at the, guy, at the level that he is already, he could have picked up another uh, two Grand Slams and you know, God knows how many millions and he stood to his guns. Yeah, that's definitely a theme if you think like, because one thing I want to get into is, you know, you're, you're, you're a standalone coach from an experience level in active modern day bodybuilding, right? Like, you know, you're contemporaries of the, of the golden era, you know, and for, for decisions, I'm sure each of their own, have kind of stepped aside to a certain degree from the sport of bodybuilding. But you're as entrenched in the bodybuilding world now 
as arguably ever in a time when the sport is definitely bigger than it's ever been. Like, you know, what, what, what personality traits, what do you attribute to your longevity within the industry and obviously the sport? And not to mention, like, you're still in better shape than 90% of the clients you work with. Yeah. Well, well you know, uh, one word that's uh, obvious and I can't hide it is passion. Passion for the sport. So, mind you, when uh, I told you that 2011, I went back to Serbia, to Europe. You know, I was uh, fed up with the few things that happened. You know, I don't want to really dig deep into this, but uh, I, I needed to leave the United States, and I was really uh, disgusted with you know certain things. I said, I'm not going to be in bodybuilding. I'm going to change the industry. I'm going to. And then while I was there, you know, I realized, who am I kidding? This is in my blood. This is what I love, right? So it was very easy for me to come back. And then when I came back to the coaching, and uh, so I was having all these athletes that I could not come to the shows and see them because uh, I was limited, I couldn't uh, travel. You know, uh, then when I made a decision, okay, I'm fully back into this and I'm gonna work with the elite athletes, conduct the seminars. As you know, when, I, when I've seen you, I was doing that uh, Ben Pakulski, uh, training camp, we did the Dubai, Melbourne, Sydney, and uh, stuff like that. So uh, I'm doing what I love doing, and uh, this is one thing that my father uh, told me, if you spend a life doing what you love doing, you would never have a job. You know, it would just be a, a pleasure. So just imagine, I mean, traveling around the world, seeing different cultures, you know, uh, being paid to do that, competing at the highest level, right? And now continuing this with, with the top athletes. I mean, I have a couple of athletes, three athletes at the Mr. Olympia. One, you know, that is very uh, likely to be a contender, you know, to win the title. And then uh, another one that's probably in another couple of years is going to be super competitive, Canadian, your, your countryman. Hmm. I Ian. wonder. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, these kind of things, it's exciting for me. I mean, you see, and I'm sure that you know that. Once you reach a certain level, and you don't know how far you can go, and then you just keep doing, applying what you know, and see what happens. And sometimes results exceed your expectations. So, for example, with the Samson Deruda, I started working with him a year and a half ago. He competed already nine shows. So imagine, you know, being so competitive, traveling. Europe, Egypt, uh, you know, U.S., you know, all over the place, uh, Korea to compete and all that stuff, and still making a, this kind of progress, you know. So when you project, what do you expect your body to be? So oh, he gained like almost 30 pounds of lean tissue and, uh, you know, getting shapelier. You know, some people, when you just pack on the mass, it goes where you don't want, them, want it to go. And then uh, is bigger necessarily better, but in his case, bigger he gets, you know, more aesthetic he he gets. You know, Did so. you, when you came back to America, and you got like more fully entrenched back into bodybuilding. Not to say that you were ever fully removed from it, but in the time span where you were maybe a little bit more, at the very least, physically distant from the sport, that was some major changes in the industry. That was some major changes in. You know, you know, the emergence of social media, the, the popularity, maybe not popularity, but the prevalence of pro cards, right? Like there's a lot that changed in your time away. Like, did you struggle adapting to the new landscape of bodybuilding when you came back from Europe? Well, well yeah, listen, I, I'm uh, from the 90s, right? And, you know, when you talk to the 90s guys, we're also proud of our golden era. And there was very few pros. To get the pro card, you have to win a nationals right you have to win a you know uh and ibb universe you know few uh countries would uh, would approve their uh, champion to be a you know ibb professional so there was very few athletes and there was very few shows now with the expansion of from a man's physique to the classic physique to the you know so many category right uh and having so many shows i think they watered it down and now when you see IBB Pro on the social media, you look at the, and say, how is this even possible, right? <laughs> this person just, you know, should not in a, in a wildest dream have a pro card, but so they do. 
But interestingly, okay, with the uh, hundreds of people um, getting a pro card, there's not too many people that compete. So it's like almost uh, I'm going to earn my, my uh, IBB Pro so I can put on my social media and, and get some recognition and uh, validity with that. Uh, I mean, I don't really get it. But I, I'm going to tell you this. With the social media, one thing Jay Cutler asked me two days ago, like, what would I change if I could, you know, for back day? I wish we had social media back in the 90s. I mean, uh, you know, so now imagine, I had a Colosseum gym in Fullerton that was the official gym for Flex Magazine photo shoots. So, Jay and Ronnie and Phil Heath and, you know, everybody at the contest, uh, in, in the contest shape, have to come and uh, take a pictures for Flex Magazines right before or right after the show. So, I have a constantly the best bodybuilders in the world staying there for a week training there and then doing the photo shoots. So imagine if I had that uh, outlet back then. I mean, Jesus. Well, you talk about people, you know, getting their pro card for recognition. Uh, the flip side of that is the industry at large is full of people who don't compete at all and are garnering a ton of recognition, right? Like YouTube and TikTok have made people in the fitness industry. Like there, I remember it was in 2000 and it was 2018. It may have been my first Olympia sponsored. I was still in my powerlifting career. And I remember walking by Tom Platts and going like, certainly that wasn't Tom Platts because there was no one bothering him. He was just walking by blue jeans, polo t-shirt, fucking ponytail. And then there was a lineup for some kid, I don't know, he maybe was 165 pounds, if that, around the entire convention center, some YouTube kid. And I was like, man, this is, you know, I, was on, I, got, I grew up training where you still had to be on like forums and magazines before the emergence of social media. And I thought, man, it's pretty sad for a guy like that who was like legendary, competed at the highest level of one of the all time greatest physiques. And for him to just be passed up as just some guy at a convention, I thought that was pretty sad. It is, but what are you going to do about it? I mean, I don't even expect people to recognize me when I'm there. Right? So actually, I'm quite surprised when somebody stops me and, and take a picture. And, and they probably know me now more from Instagram than from uh, my competitive yeah. years, you know. But what, what are you going to do? I mean, this is how it is. Uh, YouTubers are so popular. I mean, I, I had a chance to meet, <laughs> I'm not going to say the name, like uh, this 21-year-old kid YouTuber, you know, two days ago, making over $2 million a month. You know what I mean? <laughs> so Subscribe again. to the channel. Yeah. I mean, you know, so all the power to him. I mean, these opportunities, whoever can capitalize on it, do it, of course. It's just, uh, look, you are like a legitimate expert and, and uh, like when, when we touch that subject, many times when I look at your videos, you, you go way above my head with, the, with comprehension of you know, kinesiology, biomechanics and what you do, you know. So... I wish that a lot of people are listening to somebody like you, and then I get the you know the, those uh, uh, links like what do you what do you uh, think of this uh, and some pencil neck that uses you know just terminology that he just want to confuse people right and they don't understand it and they show it wrong, but he has no legitimacy because he uh, you know, mentioned some study and uh, you know the research and this. Uh, and it has nothing to do with the real life. You look uh, the part, you know the part, and I mean, <laughs> your instructions are, are next level. Uh, I wish actually you gave me a subscription to, to your, your channel. <laughs> you know, well, to, so to, and that, brings up an, that brings up an interesting point because you know, the emergence of assholes like me has really thrown a spanner in the works and a ton of confusion into like proper ways to train. It seemed like from an outsider's perspective, as a fan perspective, looking at 90s bodybuilding, that training styles of the top guys seemed more alike than different, where there didn't really seem to be much contention, or at the very least, no one cared to talk about the differences, and people kind of focused on the similarities. Is, is that an accurate cross-section of like golden era bodybuilding, that if you were to go train with another golden era bodybuilder, 
likely that you guys would be more on the same wavelength where one guy's not, well, I'm team full range of motion or I, I'm high intensity or I'm this, I'm that. Well, listen, uh, and I'm sure that you experienced because, okay, you jumped in with me and Ben uh, to, to train that uh, hack squat, super slows and all this kind of stuff, right? I, I mean, maybe something that you don't normally do, but uh, these are kind of examples that uh, I join uh, whoever and they're going to, you know, uh, want me to experiment something that they, they do. But in, in general, I have a, a athletes that don't even do the... Uh, partial movement, <laughs> speaking of a full range of motion. This would be almost like critical, you would die laughing when you see uh, what kind of range that is, right? You know, four arms, four biceps, four triceps, four, eh? and then he has a three, th three times the size of my arms, right? And uh, so now I'm supposed to tell him, hey, you're doing this wrong, right? It's just define all the logics. Then, uh, even now, there's I'm, 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 uh, who who is the? Uh, I just watched the video. Yeah, there was uh, yeah Tony Pearson, I think. You know, there, there was an uh, advertisement for his uh, driven uh, book, which I got in a uh, uh, video, and he was doing a uh, side laterals for shoulders, like pretty much the the worst possible way you can possibly do it, right? But uh, but hey, that's uh, Tony Pearson, and uh, then you look at the Arnold. I'm sure that you see some. Arnold uh, exercises back in the day that uh, you would probably cringe, right? But that's Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? So I learned all my lessons. Uh, uh, going with uh, Ben Pakoski and doing execution would be masterful, right? And it don't move anything else. But then I've seen guys that Jay Cutler, you know, for biceps, he would move like <laughs> like wind is blowing <laughs> yeah and uh, so how can you possibly say hey no no this is not the right way uh, so i experimented in both ways I, I like to isolate and feel it but then i like to incorporate everything else example that i have a, you know people ask me uh Milos, if i do whatever for chest and so be it if i bring in my delts and bring in my triceps but I can most definitely put a much bigger load on my uh, chest, being in a centric or concentric, whatever, whichever part, but I could do much more than if I'm just isolating and trying to shut off my connection with the delts and triceps. Wouldn't that be more stimulating? You know, so, uh, like, let's say I'm a chest and you're the delt, and, and now uh, if I do it alone, I can only do five you know, uh, 100 pounds, <laughs> for example. But then now when I'm doing it with you, and even though uh, we, we're doing a 900 and you're doing a, a 300, but I'm able to do 600 now just with your assistance, and I can get more than normally I would just on a chest. I don't know if I'm even making sense yeah, of yeah. giving you... Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, because uh, it's hard for me to uh, explain that. Because I've seen this happen with uh, with many guys, right? I I uh, stabilize them, you know. I don't let them move anything else, or I, I let them, you know, have a little bit of uh, free movement, and uh, you know, <laughs> they 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 had much better results the other way. So I I start I stop telling them, you know, exactly. I can throw in advice let them choose, and then watch them. But you know how it is, when they switch back to uh, what they normally did, <clears throat> I'm not gonna insist. Yeah. How has yeah. your training evolved over the years? Like, you know, how, lo how long have you been in the gym for? Since September 18, 1981. I love I, that you know I, the day. I kid you not, I remember that very well. Uh, you know, because uh, I don't know if you heard that story. First in Serbia, Yugoslavia back in the day, <laughs> there's no bodybuilders walking around. There's no magazines that you can actually see that human body can be so muscular, right? So I was in the, you know, judo at the time, and then uh, uh, I've seen a magazine, and it's like Arnold Schwarzenegger. It, it's just like, I just got his book. Do you get his book? The the uh, seven rules. What is it called? 
Uh, ah, be useful. Be, be useful, yeah. Yeah. Send it to us for life. Uh, I just got it yesterday. Uh, so, what I was saying. So when I realize human body can actually look that way, right? This is when, uh, that's when uh, I had a, a discussion with my father and he said, oh, that's narcissistic. So what do you mean narcissistic? Man can be skinny, undeveloped, fat, out of shape, or muscular, right? What would man supposed to choose, right? So for, for me, discovery of, oh, this is actually possible, how it would be possible. And then I, I remember seeing this uh, guy, he was Hungarian, living in, in Serbia, and I've seen him a uh, year before, and then I see him a year later, and he's like, holy, sh what are you doing? He says, I'm lifting weights. You know, so that day, September 18, <laughs> so I'm coming, where is your, your gym? He didn't have a gym, he had a, in a house, the concrete weight and all that stuff. So I, I just went straight that day, we took the pictures and everything else. Um, and if you can imagine, zero idea of training. Like, you don't even know, like, uh, <laughs> you go in, you don't know a single exercise, you don't know the single muscle, you don't know nothing, right? So of course, first I was just following what he was doing. And then uh, whatever I would do, and whichever, uh, it, it was not my muscle connection and squeezing the muscle, it was just like lifting the weights a certain way. So next day, you would be, no, next day, two days later, you would be like miserably sore. So you know to identify which muscle did the work. This is how I started, right? And also what, you, what is interesting, of course, right away you think, oh, I want this so bad, I want it quickly. So. I, I train like three hours a day, you know? So of course, three months later, I was just still eating the same mama's diet, mama's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, whatever is served. So I got smaller. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah, so, so it's like, oh, what the hell? So th this is, you know, how I started, of course. I'm sure that you, at your time, and uh, where you started, you had already much more information. I had zero information zero experts around, zero magazines, zero, you know, books, you know, so uh, that was completely, of course, trial and error. So as that evolved, like, I think one of the things that makes, I don't want to say bodybuilding easier, because that's not the right way to word it, but I think a lot about, uh, so Roger Bannister was the first guy to break a four minute mile. And the next weekend, like four guys ran a four minute mile. So it was thought to be this like insurmountable feat of, uh, of, of physical endurance or speed or, uh, you know, just something that couldn't be done. It was like this mental block that the whole world had. But once he saw that he did it, everyone was like, oh, it can be done. And then it was done. Today with social media and like the popularity behind competing, growing, growing and growing, it's like, you know, when I see someone like when someone diets now, they know it can be done, right? They, they, have, they, have, they have a coach that has gone through it and go, you know, yeah, I've been 4% body fat. It's going to suck. You're going to not be able to sleep. You're going to lose your sex drive, all these things. What was the experience like getting into the competitive field with, with no real Roger Bannister, right? With not like the inundation of like, wow, everyone does this. This shouldn't, I can do this. Yeah, well, now on that note, because you said you have a, uh, a large experience with the Serbians. Uh, nobody in Serbia uh, had achieved anything in bodybuilding, really, right? So, you know, as soon as I got into this, okay, I, I decided I'm going to be Mr. Universe. You know, this was, uh, this was my goal. Of course, at that time, I didn't even know of Mr. Olympia. I mean, there was like, uh, what is the difference, uh, federations and all that stuff. But... One thing immediately that I, I uh, once have seen Arnold's um, picture in the magazine and then Frank Zane and everybody else, Sergeant Bray, Frank Zane became my, my idol. I, I took the, his poster and put it in, uh, in my room. You know, that 1977 uh, Mr. Olympia with, with his uh, uh, classic pose, you know, in the purple trunks. I, I, I visualized, so I visualized myself in the image very close to him, right? Symmetrical, aesthetic physique and all that stuff. And I just said, okay, I'm going to, you know, create that kind of physique. I announced it in my country, right? I'm going to America. And I'm going to compete at Mr. Olympia, right? 
It was zero doubt in my mind. I don't know if uh, you also heard that, but I, I had a, this kind of... I lost my, uh, my journals. Uh, I, I, I was writing journals, every single gram of protein, carbs, fat, everything that I do, every rep, every, you know, in a calculation, but at the end of the day, it would be 500 grams of protein, so much carbs, so much fat, so many calories, and check, good day, good day. So, uh, 1987, uh, I'm sorry, 19, uh, uh, yeah, 87, I put on the one of those, uh, five-year plan. I'm going to come to America, win Miss Universe, qualify for Mr. Olympia, and make a living off of bodybuilding. I came in 87 in October for Miss Universe. I won Universe 89. I turned professional 91. I got the Weider contract uh, in February 92. And I qualify for Olympia in the first year. And I promise you, I mean, even now when I'm thinking like, why would I be certain that this is going to happen. I was certain. I'm, I didn't speak English. You know the story. I had a $428.10 to my name, you know, and I came here to make a living, <laughs> you know, spend the, you know, all the money right away. So, like, part of my diet was starvation. I didn't have any food, you know, to eat. That. <laughs> That's how I, I was keeping it lean. You know, in, in general, I had that vision that I'm going to do that. Why? Don't ask me. I mean, really, even right now, it boggles my mind. Why was I so certain that I could do it? But one thing that I got from uh, my dad, right, is uh, I'm not inferior or superior to anyone. We have all flesh and blood, and uh, with the right information and right hard work, you can achieve anything. I'm sure that this is how Novak Djokovic was thinking the same thing. You, you, you've seen him, seven, eight years old kid, saying... You know, his goal is to, to win Wimbledon, right? Uh, we, we, you would be lack, laughing stock of the nation. And I was back in the day when I was leaving uh, uh, Serbia. And I was saying, I'm going to win, uh, you know, Mr. Universe. I'm going to go on Mr. Olympia. I, I mean, people making uh, jokes about it. But why not? You know, you, you just tell me, right? Why not? So, of course, uh, <clears throat> uh, when I start competing... Uh, my first contest, I didn't expect to, to qualify for Olympia. And I qualify right away. So the things were happening much faster for, for me than, uh, than I was even expecting. As you kind of advance through your career and in different aspects of competing and into coaching and traveling around the world and uh, you know, leaving the United States, living abroad, coming back, transitioning out of competition into coaching, have, has that... Is that like steadfast belief, that unwavering confidence? Is that always follow you? Or have you run into now, the more you do things, like, is there doubt? Is there questioning? Because I think a lot of people are, I would say most people are unlike, well, technically most people are unlike you because I'm talking to you and you are someone who's worth talking to. So there's a lot of people who aren't worth talking to. So the, I guess like, you know, you're, you're an anomaly in a lot of ways, but do you struggle with normal people problems in not having that confidence outside of things like, like as you've evolved, have you have, have you do you come across trepidation in things you do now? Because now arguably the stakes are way higher. Yeah. You know, there's always that question, right? Uh, whoever tells you that they, they never question, that they don't have a doubts, they don't have a fears, you know, they're lying, right? You know, second guessing yourself and all that stuff. But look, from a competitor to the coaching, I didn't plan to coach. I mean, this is not something that I, I wanted, but just uh, certain things uh, that I got from my father. Uh, like Bruce Lee, observe everything, you know, the, uh, accept what is useful, discard what is useless, create your own. Everything that makes sense. And my father, doctor of science of neuropsychiatry, right? Uh, super educated that had to follow the certain rules. He was very much open-minded and said, you can question everything. You can question historical events that history can be written by the, the winners and maybe it's not the truth what you're reading. And then science. You are allowed to question the science, right? If it doesn't make sense, why wouldn't you, you know, try something else? So in, in any way, all the, that science of hypertrophy and everything else, I'm sure that uh, you heard some of my 
theories of that hyperemia advantage system and all that stuff that it's never proven anywhere. But uh, I applied it. It worked for me tremendously, right? You know, I actually visualized that blood. You know, I, I just posted on my Instagram. I don't know if you've seen some of the experts were talking about hundred time, hundredfold increased blood flow to the muscle. Maybe a week ago, or you can see on my Instagram uh, during a training. So if you have a hundredfold of your blood going into the muscle that you're training, only when you train, right? And now if I saturate that blood and I deliver and every muscle contraction would possibly open up the cells that's ready for uptake, all this stuff. I didn't read anywhere that this could be used for my purpose of hypertrophy. I said, why wouldn't I use it? So I tried it and it worked wonders for me. And then this is what I was you know, teaching my clients and everybody was having a great uh, success. I'm sure that Ben Pakulski would probably tell you back in the day when he came to train with me for the first time, you know, I overloaded him with uh, so much nutrients and then I, I, I did all this crazy giant sets and stimulation of every kind from heavy to slow to, you know, peak contraction for, you know, stretch overload, you know, just spice it up. There is no real science behind it. My only science was maximize everything maximize delivery, max saturate the blood, and then uh, maximize the stimulation with all kinds of you know, contractions. I, I was getting these results and then people start asking me and I would always uh, volunteer. And that's how I became a coach. You know, I, I didn't really plan to be a coach. And of course, uh, you know, so, so once you start giving advice to somebody and they keep asking you week after week after week and they want want you to follow them all the way to the show, then of course you become their coach. And then it, it became the, the job and the business. So you have, of recent history, some of the freakiest physiques that has ever dawned the bodybuilding stage. Two that come to mind, obviously you mentioned Samson. Um, you know, I, I believe if I'm not mistaken, you've done some work with Andrew, and, and correct me if I'm wrong there. And um, Jack, no, no. I didn't. Oh, no, I thought, no. I thought uh, oh, you know what? It was probably you were both in Vegas at the same time. Uh, yeah, I was, I was uh, uh, you know, giving him some posing advice with Flex Wheeler when he was there. You know? But, yeah. Uh, yeah. You see, uh, if you didn't follow from back in those times, my first guy that I really helped was Nasser Al-Sambari. And uh, transformation of Nasser 94 Olympia to 95, Night of the Champions, you know, so whoever wants to Google it and find it, you know, that was that, that, that uh, mind boggling, you know, just like explosion that from a normal guy, he became a, a top Olympia contender. He plays uh, third and then second. And uh, I, I mean, really blew up that you cannot actually think this is feasible that that much muscle uh, and volumization can be created in six months period. Okay, and then after that, you know, I, I started getting other guys that were interested in my method. When did you stop competing, and when did you? When well, who was your first client to coach? What was the what was the uh, you know what was the overlap there? I, I mean, <laughs> when I mentioned uh, Nasser, uh, I was helping him uh, ninety five, and uh, we competed. I, I I basically helped him beat me in the contest. <laughs> you know, we, I mean, we were going into, for Houston and other champions. And like I said, and I, I stay behind it, if anybody would tell you otherwise, I never had a single secret. Ask me the question, I'm going to answer it. I'm going to always answer it truthfully. Because why would I, what's the point of lying, right? So I'm going to tell you. But Nasser was the first guy that, uh, I'm, I'm bummed that I can't find my uh, journals I was going to show you. Uh, you know, when he looked at my journals, initially he didn't believe anything. He thought that I gave him that journal to trick him, you know, to trick him, you know, because this is exactly how many bodybuilders are, right? So imagine eight meals a day, 365 days a year, and I'm giving you a journal, and then I'm giving you three years worth, okay? And then, you know, you would think, oh, no, 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 you made this just to trick me. Like, for the love of God. You're a Serbian, you're a Serbian spy. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, uh, Nasser was uh, uh, part Serbian. You know, his mother, uh, and uh, they, they spoke our language. You know, the Serbian when we got together. But he was uh, really my first client. Now, uh, I competed with Dennis James in '99, not of the champions, and uh, then I sent him all my protocols, how to do it, when to do it, and then he started. So I was still active. Uh, competitor, but I was coaching others, you know. Uh, and then when I retired, 2003, I was in uh, uh, Hungary. Gustavo Badal, now as he heard my official retirement on the stage, he came up to me and he says, "Oh, he would like to work with me." I said, "Gustavo, uh, I was with uh, um, Eric Serrano and uh, Charles Polikin in Puerto Rico before for a, a training camp." And he came visit, and I offered him my help, but he didn't accept it because I was still competing. So, you know, this kind of mentality, right? They would not trust you until you stop competing. And so, so Gustavo Badal, 2003, uh, when I, I started working with him, 2004, he was top three Olympia, 2005, right? He, he was instantly, you know, so he, those are some of my first clients. And then uh, Dennis Wolf, uh, you know, there was Marilyn Anthony. I, I pretty much work with just about anyone, you know, here and there. If, you know, not for many years, but at least for some shows. Do you think that helped your transition out of competing? Like, were you worried at all when you retired that, you know, of, like, a lot of athletes suffer with that, right? You know, like, we, the ident they identify as an athlete that gets taken away from them when they retire. Do, do you think that helped in the transition? Or were you happy with your decision to step away from the stage? Well, at the time uh, when I stepped away, I was really uh, thinking like, okay, you know, uh, I'm 40 years old, you know, it's it's time to you know look elsewhere. But I start uh, training all these guys: Dennis Wolf, Sylvia Samuel, Hiratari Magishi. There was like uh, Johnny Jackson uh, competing in a, a 2007 Olympia. So I was training them. And I'm going to tell you, maybe you can appreciate this story. So, you know, uh, I've known for some giant sets. I do, I do uh, still some heavy duty, progressive overload, a couple of exercises. And then I do the giant sets. So when I was training them, now I would design some crazy uh, giant sets. I, I want you to do this, 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 this. And then they would say, ah, oh, excuse me, I don't know if I can say on the podcast, F you word. You can, you uh, can. Yes, you can. Yeah, okay. Fuck you, that's impossible. And then, you know, when I heard this, and listen, I was already, you know, retired, right? And just that idea that they didn't want to even attempt, you know, uh, what, what I told them. So I went there, and whatever I told them to do, I did it right in front of them. So then they had to follow, okay? And then, you know, I figure I did it second day and third day. And then I started training with them. And, you know, as a side effect, obviously, you get in shape. So I decided, yeah, I decided I, I was going to compete 20%. And uh, I don't know if you know the, that story with uh, uh, Arnold going to Australia as a CBS commentator, but then end up actually competing, you know, going to the, you know, Mr. Olympia 1980. You, you know the story when he went to... No, uh, no, no, I've never heard it. Okay, so he was... Uh, retired, 1975, six Mr. Olympia titles, nobody's going to ever do that. Then he did a uh, preparation for Conan, the barbarian, and uh, he was in shape for uh, Conan, right? And then 1980, he's going to Australia as a CBS commentator, you know, and uh, nobody thought of him ever competing. So he comes to athletes' uh, meeting and picked the competitive number, and then he competed in 98, 1980 Olympia, and he won. Controversial victory, but he did that. So now I am an IBB professional. I was paying my my membership, right? And uh, 2006, if you remember, that's the year when Jay Cutler finally uh, beat Ronnie Coleman. And I had a uh, five guys uh, also preparing there. He, there was Hida and Dennis and uh, you know some other guys. So I was in such a good shape. I promise you, I didn't like diet for the show. But you know, when, when you are active, you're all day in the gym, you train twice 
with the guys, because we, we did the two workout sessions every day, six days a week, I, I get in this kind of shape that I say, like, you know what? I'm ready to compete. So I go to Europe. The first show is in Austria, which uh, uh, Jay won, uh, Ronnie was second, and then Dennis James was my athlete, he was competing. You know, there, there was Marcus Rule and all that stuff. There, I had uh, five guys in that show, I couldn't compete. But next day in Romania, uh, only Hida Yamagishi was going there. So I, I, I said, you know what, let me just, you know, load up night before and take a diuretic and see what I look like. And uh, I woke up looking crazy, right? I said, okay, that's it. I'm shaving my legs, I'm shaving my uh, you know, body. I'm, I'm gonna compete. Because I was there to be a, a, a MC at the show. I, I said like, okay, I'm gonna do it. But then I was in contest shape. So I shaved everything from the front and uh, I was gonna do it. And I have a picture, uh, you know, maybe I'll send you, I'll Google it. Me and Jay Cutler in a room. Uh, and that was the picture. Phone rings, uh, I pick up the phone, that was uh, Jay Cutler and said, Milos, can you do me a favor? I said, sure, what is it? Can you put the tan on me? He says, okay, you know. So he comes, it's still like two hours before the prejudging, right? There's plenty of time. But he brought that little uh, sponge like this and, uh, you know, Gentana and shit. Like, by the time I put all this color, it was already like, uh, you know, too little time. And then Hidetada came to the room for me to check on him. And uh, his good friend is now my wife, Hiroko Suzuki. Oh, no way. Yeah. So she was there. You know how Japanese always have a camera? She's like, oh, you know, Betty, can you just take a picture of me and, and uh, Jay? And you see, I was in contest shape. I was ready to compete. So as your question was, transitioning from a... Um, uh, competitor into the coach. Now I was a coach, but I had this burning desire. I, I'm going to do it, right? I'm still going to do it. But I didn't have a time to shave my back. <laughs> I said, okay. So I missed it. So I was ready for 2007 Ironman. And uh, if you follow the Ironman, the best possible stage lights are at the Ironman. So especially if you know how to you know, create the illusion of being full as a house, you're gonna look crazy at, at, at that. So I was hoping I can do the 2007 Ironman, but then I got suspended from the IABB. So, and I was suspended for a year. I was gonna do it 2008, but they, they uh, continued with suspension for like three years and then uh, I finally gave up. Yeah, but no. you know, just to tell you, so, I still had that competitive spirit at that time. And uh, at that time, I would still be competitive, you know, but after that, I, I did realize, you know, when uh, you're 40 plus and you have all these aches and pains and injuries and you have to work around it, you know. I, I'm going to tell you, two days ago, I asked Jay Cutler uh, when he retired, you know, he didn't have that drive. Well, he had a drive 2013. He wanted to come back again and possibly defeat uh, Phil Heath, just like when he lost to Dexter Jackson 2008 and he came back 2009. Now he lost to Phil Heath and he wanted to come back. But uh, after his one bicep tear that he had, uh, whichever year, then he had uh, another one. And then he just, you know, couldn't couldn't prepare, and uh, and that would cause him to retire. I mean, you're still in ridiculous shape. Yeah. Is it is it or has it been difficult to train without a goal? Because like you know, you, there are guys who you competed against, golden era guys who like are a little rusty for the golden era now, but like you still, you still got it. Like every now and then you do like a physique update. Everyone's like, what the fuck is this? This is nuts. But you know, you do, I'm sure, look at you. I mean, uh, you don't compete, but look at you. I mean, th this is you that identifies you. You are, you know, muscular and strong and active. If somebody would force me to train, I wouldn't train. Of course, I love it. If somebody, and I tell you, there was a period of time, 
uh, when I told you, when I went back to Europe, I said, I'm just going to be a normal guy. I'm not going to train. You know, I'm not going to eat, you know, uh, my measured protein and carbs and calories and all this stuff. I'm just going to eat whatever. I was miserable. I can't stand junk food. I cannot have a breakfast, lunch, and dinner for, or let me choose beef stroganoff or, you know, whatever. I eat like I, I did all my career. I love good nutrition. I, I visualize whatever I put in my mouth, you know, as far as choices of protein and carbs and fat, breaking down in amino acids. I, I visualize those amino acids being incorporated into the muscle. I have to give a reason to be directed to the muscle, so I have to train, right? Stimulate, so I can visualize, I can have a reason. I, that the glucose that I take, because I was always high carb uh, guy, I, I was not uh, into keto and using fat as a fuel. I would always go high protein, high carbs, and uh, very low fat. I have to, as uh, Charles Polikin would say, deserve my carbs, right? And this is pretty much how it is. I deserve my carbs, and I have my carbs, and uh, that was it. So I, I prefer this kind of eating. There's no difference. It's just like before I compete and I have to be extremely hypertrophic and glycogen loaded and all this stuff. Now I'm just being in shape, you know. So you scale down, but you still do the same thing. It's just, it's crazier to me that you live in Vegas, which is like the most indulgent city in the entire world. So you're somehow living this this you know Yugoslavian monk lifestyle in this the opulent most extravagant city on the planet like do you i mean obviously your environment is strongly like revolving around fitness but like that has to be difficult like there has to be a temptation there to be like oh i'm gonna, the cosmo breakfast buffet forget about it like you just you ever just go nuts you know especially with the serbian mentality i mean just imagine <laughs> you, you give serbian a uh, free buffet they're going to starve themselves to death. I mean, this is exactly what happened to me, you know. Uh, first, my first experience, I came 87, you know, I don't know the concept of all you can eat food, you know, what do you mean? And as you can imagine, like I, I told you, I had no money, starving. And then somebody told me, you know what, that Swedish small board is like all you can eat food, you pay whatever and then you can eat all you want. I said, no, this, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't exist. So I go there, of course, after the contest, you can imagine, it is all you can eat, all you can eat. My limited uh, uh, English language is, but all you can eat. Is this, that means I can eat everything? Yeah. So I put like 10 plates of everything and anything, right? But then, I do remember this, I look at the, uh, the wall, and I see something like, if you don't eat everything you have to pay for whatever you need it's like oh my god i had like like literally 10 plates of everything and now i have to stuff myself with all that because i didn't have a additional money to pay the rest you know so i was miserable before and that was really uh, i mean the worst experience of my life you know when you kind of have to lean forward to make a room to expand the belly because there is way too much and I said, I would never do this again. Even years after, every time I would go to buffet, right, I would have that mentality. If, if you pay the price, you want to get more for the money, right? And right. That, that's a Serbian mentality. So yeah, yeah. I realized I, I just can't, I can't go to these kind of things, you know, because yeah, as regimented as I am, there's still that urge to... Uh, Get your money worth. <laughs> now, like, yeah, so speaking I, of reg I don't go to any of those. Well, speaking yeah. of regimented, you know, one of the, the things that's most impressive about your, your ability to maintain your physique, aside from everything, is that you're, you're pretty active on the road, right? You, you travel a fair bit and have in recent years. Like, do you, like, what difficulty? I'm basically trying to make you relatable to a normal person because so far it's been like, yeah, I moved to America with $400. I don't know what everyone's all wound up about. I wrote five things down. I did all five in five years. Uh, I don't really get tempted by food. Like right now, you're, you're like, you're almost, you just have like a, a, an, an immortal mindset 
Like, is there, like what struggles and difficulties do you run into your regiment in your current lifestyle? Well, listen, I mean, uh, to be fair, right? Everybody has some aspirations what they, they want to reach. You see, uh, you don't become a bodybuilder, you know, to make shit lot of money. No bodybuilder was making money, right? So that was not my uh, uh, priority. I'm raised in a, a family that, uh, you know, in Serbia, it's socialistic medicine. My father would make pennies, right? And uh, he, he would not reach, you know, okay, uh, my goal is now to, to make comfortable life and make shit a lot of money. So I was never really into this. Uh, choosing the businesses to, you know, some people are really into that. Uh, I'm not. I'm uh, satisfied with uh, the, w what uh, uh, I have and uh, what I'm doing, even though uh, I'm surrounded with super successful people, the, not millionaires, but billionaires, right? And uh, of course, uh, you know, sometimes you question yourself, why didn't I, you know, want to go that direction? Yeah. I mean, you entrepreneur, you know, when I was around Ben Pakoski, I've seen his business mind. You know, I, I'm just not. You know, the, the, this is this is not me. Maybe that's my Serbian mentality. I'm content where I'm at. So, you know, uh, I learned that one thing. You know, not to live in the future. I live in the moment. I'm enjoying it. You probably see me um, in all the UFC events. You know, so I, I'm here, blessed to know uh, Hunter Campbell and Dana White, right? And uh, they uh, allow me to come to all this. This is what I need. Uh, the, the elite bodybuilding, you know, uh, access to the gyms and access to the UFC. When you say I'm in uh, Las Vegas and everything is happening, I've never been to the bar in my life. What, do I, what is for me to do in the bar? People drink there. Do I want to drink? No. Do I want to drink with the... With the loaded drunk people no do i have a business going there no you know so i don't do uh, nothing that uh, is maybe tempting to do if it's not something that i want to do you know if i would want to do it of course i would reach for it but no oh man it's 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 just, it's funny it is your i mean like i said earlier like you're so anomalous but the mindset is something like the like you have this Kind of like a mortal mindset that's really not like, especially kids of our generation, like being in the middle, UFC, Conor McGregor, right? Everything's TMZ, everything is hype, Israel Adesanya, you know, uh, Khabib, everything is, uh, is, is over-publicized. It's really odd to kind of see like this very like monk-like mentality amidst the mo two of the most insane, chaotic, self-indulgent, indulgent sports on the planet. And then there's... There's, there's, you know, Novi Sad Milos just kind of sitting there as this, as this sort of wise oracle. It's just, it's, it's, do you ever find yourself like, you know, in being present going like, holy shit, what the fuck am I doing here? Uh, I mean, listen, you always, uh, uh, you know, make one step at a time in a, a forward direction where you wanted to go. I'm exactly what I want to be. I mean, now you mentioned Israel Adesanya. I, I had the... Uh, privilege to go for dinner with him. Hunter Campbell invited me. Uh, there was Leon Edwards and Adesanya. And imagine having a dinner and uh, talking to them. Yeah, this fulfills me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I live for these kind of moments. Uh, I was actually going to go to the Abu Dhabi. I did uh, last year for uh, Islam Akachev and uh, Charles Rivera fight. And I was this close to, to go again, but uh, uh, I didn't organize my training camps. So uh, I'm passing. No, listen, I'm uh, exactly what I want to be, uh, doing exactly what I want to do. So I don't think it's going to get any better than that. I'm going to close on that before I berate you with more questions. It's, I mean, you're always a breath of fresh air. I love getting to ch uh, chat with you and have dinner in Oz. And uh, I look forward to uh, crossing paths and like ships in the night again at some point. And yeah, really uh, a perspective mindset that I think a lot of people need to need to hear and, and, and abide by because it's uh, it's pretty rare well listen i mean uh, thank you for the interview and uh i, I would want to interview you uh, back and forth you know with, with all your theories and uh, 
and training style and everything. I mean, uh, yeah, you are, you are highly regarded as as a, a expert that the people come to. So I always like to to see your stuff. Uh, are you oh. coming to Vegas anytime soon? The second you tell me to, I will book a flight. Really? <laughs> All right. Oh yeah, fuck I mean, yeah, listen. man. I'm. It's, it's, it's Mr. Olympia, uh, you know, in three weeks, so I'm super busy right now. But right after oh, the yeah, Olympia, yeah. you know, yeah, let's do yeah. that. Say the yes, word, sir. man. I'm, I'm not afraid of airplanes, and it'd be an honor and a privilege to break bread again. So let's, let's set it up, man. I'm there. Yeah, by all means. All right, my man. Oh, yeah. Awesome, man. Thank, Thank you so much for your time, brother. And, uh, oh, yeah. Back to you soon. Of course. Cheers, man. Thank you.